Today we're going to talk about um, the March 2021 FOMC uh, meeting. Uh, and it was the first FOMC meeting for the new chair of, um, of the Fed, Jay Powell. And to set the scene, um, it's, he's taking over the Fed at, at what is seen as a perilous time in the sense that um, inflation is ticking up, inflation is increasing. Unemployment has been falling for uh, a long, long time. And this is a difficult juncture in, uh, in general for policymakers. And to step into the chair's role uh, at this time, um, it's, uh, it's tricky. Uh, and so, um, so for example, a former Fed staffer, Seth Carpenter, um, said that we shouldn't es underestimate how perilous the, the current situation is. And the situation is, uh, as, as I said, inflation has been ticking up. It's still low, right? It's still 2%, a little bit below 2%. Unemployment has, has plummeted. Uh, and in a situation like that, you might expect uh, that there's no slack in the economy, right? That unemployment rate is now below the natural rate. Inflation should really start to pick up. Um, and so there's no slack if you look at the labor market. There's no slack if you look at where output is relative to potential GDP. So across various indicators, there's a lack of slack. And historically, that's led to, that's led to in inflation. Um, at the same time, Powell has to continue the navigation away from zero interest rates, away from zero Fed funds rate. He's been steadily increasing the Fed funds rate. And he has to navigate unwinding the Fed's or some portion of the Fed's $4.5 trillion balance sheet, right? So these are kind of, this is the, the, the situation that he's, that he's walked into, uh, as, it, as it were. So, so what we'll do today is just go through the materials that were presented at the end of the March 2021 FOMC meeting. Uh, and we'll kind of go through it systematically in a way, and I've grouped some things in, in, in ways that hopefully will um, shed some light um, uh, on their thinking. And so we'll just go through the, the, the FOMC statement itself. Um, and importantly, tacked on to the end of the statement is th this decisions on monetary policy implementation. That's it, actually very important. So it's, it's often seen as just an extra page, but, but there's a lot of information in it as well. Then we'll go to the economic projections of the board members and the, and the bank presidents and the, the quote unquote dot plots that everybody gets excited about. Um, and then to the press conference with his prepared remarks and Q&A. So the general structure of any FOMC statement, so the one pager or two pager that they release at the end of the F FOMC meeting is usually pretty much the same. Um, paragraph one just quickly, very quickly summarizes current conditions with the respect to the things that the Fed cares about, so labor market conditions, economic activity. They'll have some mention of, of consumption, investment, government spending, net, net exports. Um, and certainly, we'll talk about inflation and inflation expectations as, as well. Paragraph two then, then says, hey, look, we have a mandate, right? We have rules that we're governed by. Um, here's our mandate, right? It tells us this is what Congress has told us that we have to focus on. And it's to foster maximum employment and price stability. Um, those two terms themselves are pretty vague. Um, the FOMC on the price stability, the FOMC interprets price stability as 2% inflation um, with, a, with a symmetric uh, target, not asymmetric. It's not a ceiling. It's a symmetric target. Um, and so they, that's paragraph two. Paragraph three will note any of their policy changes. Um, and just say, oh, you know, we increased the Fed funds rate, or we cho we chose not to. Uh, and then paragraph four says what they're going to do going forward. And that's always we're going to look at everything, we're going to consider everything, and uh, everything will dictate what we're going to do going forward, right? So that's a that's a kind of vague closing paragraph. Into some of the specifics from the from this last one, current conditions, the labor market um, it has strengthened, economic activity. Uh, is growing at a moderate rate, so not too fast, not too slowly. Um, inflation, inflation expectations are, are well anchored, right? So they're not, uh, they're not increasing too much. Um, the, so with respect to the mandate, 
Powell, the FOMC, said that the economy is doing well, right? So it says economic outlook has strengthened, inflation expected to move up in coming months and stabilize around our 2% objective. So this is a very kind of benign assessment of the, uh, of, of the current conditions. And, uh, and it states that the policy path, so the path for the Fed funds rate, is, is continued slow increases, right? That's, um, that's, that's, what he, that's what the FOMC foresees. They always talk about the balance of risk to their assessment. Um, and so is it on the output side? Like, so are they worried that output might disappoint, right? That we might fall into a recession? Or is it on the inflation side? And here they say um, that there are not much risk to the forecast, but if there are any, it's, a, it's an inflation, right? So they have their eyes peeled, ready for inflation to pick up. Paragraph three with the policy change, they increase the, the Fed funds rate um, to 1.5 1 to 1.75%. And that's a level that they still describe as accommodative, right? So all, all in, you would call that relatively loose policy still. They don't think about this as restrictive monetary policy. Um, and, uh, and going forward, uh, they, they think that uh, economic conditions are going to evolve in a way that they're pleased with, right? So moderate GDP growth, not too much inflation, should have slow increases in the Fed funds rate. Um, but, but the rates, the, the Fed funds rate, are likely, likely to remain pretty low um, for a long time. And so the upshot from just from the statement, right? This is from a page and a half prepared statement. Economy doing well, growth is moderate, inflation, inflation approaching their target, conditions suggest a gradual tightening. Monetary policy can be described as accommodative, and the committee is monitoring inflation developments closely. Of course they are. It's their, it's, it's their job, but they state it again at the, at the end. Then this second page that often is, uh, you know, some people overlook. Uh, the second page or, or second item in the FOMC statement is this decisions on how to implement monetary policy. And there they mentioned um, a number of things, but also what they're going to do with their balance sheet going forward. Uh, and in particular, um, the balance sheet has been, so Janet Yellen announced in September uh, of last year, that the balance sheet would start to be reduced um, by a certain amount each month. Uh, and this, this amount was $20 billion a month, uh, that they were reducing the size of their $4.5 trillion balance, dollar balance sheet. Um, and the way that they were doing this is every month, some of their holdings of treasuries and some of their holdings of agency debt um, mature, right? And so when they mature, they get that face value back. They get a big principal repayment back. It used to be that they would reinvest those principal repayments to, to maintain the size of the balance sheet so that it would not shrink at all. Now what they're saying is we're, we, um, um, we're going to let the, so through March, going to let the balance sheet shrink by $20 billion a month. That is, we'll reinvest everything else uh, above $20 billion, but $20 billion we're not going to reinvest. We're just going to let, let it roll off our balance sheet let the balance sheet um, um, reduce. Uh, and in April, so starting this month, it's, uh, that's up to 30 billion, uh, 30 billion a month that they're going to allow this to, uh, to decline. And the expectation is it'll go up to 50 billion a month uh, soon enough, right? And so this is the Fed telegraphing exactly how they expect to shrink their, their very, very large uh, balance sheet. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an, an important point. Then you get to the economic projections. And this is um, uh, something that's very new for the Fed, very new um, uh, if, you're, uh, old, uh, if you're old enough, uh, very new. But so January 2012 was the first time that they actually published their projections. And before that, they never did. Um, uh, I think they were released maybe with a five-year lag previously. But now, at the end of every other FOMC meeting, they'll, re they'll re um, release the projections. Um, the, these projections, to be clear, are, are the opinions of each of the seven board members, of so the board members at the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., plus the 12 
president uh, of the regional Fed, Fed banks, right? So there's 12 regional Feds, Richmond, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, et cetera, et cetera, out to San Francisco. Um, 12 regional Fed banks, and so there's 19 FOMC members um, um, or, or you know, people who uh, sub submit their uh, um, projections. And they're then brought together. The averages are taken, sort of trimmed means are taken, central tendencies. There's, there's the for, the FO for the Fed funds projections, they plot out every single projection. Now, uh, remember, this is just the individual FOMC members' opinions in some sense, right? So it's not an official projection. It's just a gathering of, of, of opinions. And I would put forward that it's actually difficult to extract meaningful information from these projections. That said, there's a lot of interest in them. You see, you, you, they're written about uh, after every FOMC meeting. One thing that you can say, so if you combine, if you, if, if you look back at what they were projecting for 2018, for this year, back in 2015 or back in 2016 or, uh, or as opposed to now, the projections have really changed, right? So that is, the world didn't turn out the way the Fed thought it was going to turn out, right? So, uh, GD, so GDP growth is much stronger than they thought it was going to be. Unemployment is much, much lower than they thought it was going to be. But inflation is about where they thought it would be, right? So that is a, that is a disconnect there. They've got a much stronger economy with much lower unemployment than they expected, but inflation is right where they expect it to be. So that's a disconnect that we'll, that we'll come back to. The, these are the dot plots of the F, uh, different FOMC members' um, um, projections for the Fed funds rate. Um, and we can see what they're currently projecting in March 2018 versus what they were thinking uh, back in uh, 2015. And if we focus on, on just the, the, 28, uh, the 2018 uh, projections currently versus the 2018 projections that were made a few years ago, you see that they used to think the Fed funds rate was going to be a lot higher than it currently is. Right? Uh, so they've really ratcheted down their expectations for the Fed funds rate. And even if you go to the long term, uh, their long term view of what the Fed funds rate wi will be, that's come down a, a lot too, right? So this is a fundamental change in thinking that now they think that interest rates, especially the Fed funds rate, is going to be much lower than, than, than previously thought. Um, so now let's go to the, the um, prepared remarks, post-FOMC pre prepared remarks and Q&A the, from the press conference. And this is typically where you get the most information. So other than the policy statement, sure, that's, that's important. Uh, but here is where you get to see the thinking of, of the chair, right? In this case, Powell. Um, and what's on the minds of, of financial, uh, a, a financial journalist as well. Uh, and so the prepared remarks are usually a couple pages, and the chair will just get into a little bit more detail on the, on the current conditions. Um, and, and Powell did so in th this case, and it was really just providing a little bit more color to, to what was already in the FOMC statement. Then you get to the Q&A, and that's where it gets interesting. Um, so there were a number of questions. So there were about 20 questions in this particular press conference. Um, a, a number of them were on this notion of slack, right? And, and just, is there slack in the economy? If there's not slack in the, econ in the economy, which uh, a number of indicators would, would suggest, then why aren't we seeing inflation, right? Is it that we just, that the relationship ha that, that we're used to has broken down? Um, and uh, on this, um, Powell was, uh, so often uh, I would term it as he gave no direct answer, NDA, no direct answer, uh, in that he said some things that were probably true, um, but didn't really take a stand on, on whether um, the relationship had broken down or not, the relationship between slack and, and inflation. Um, and he reminded the audience that um, any measure of slack is comparing uh, the actual condition versus something that's unobservable. And that unobservable thing is estimated subject to error. We don't really know where the natural rate of unemployment is. We don't really know where potential GDP is. And so this notion of slack is 
um, um, I don't want to say slippery, but it's a, it, it's a little nebulous, right? And, and so, um, so he just reminded uh, the audience uh, of that. Um, they're on heightened alert that there's no slack in the economy based on many indicators, but there's no inflation, right? And so they, they think that the next step for inflation might be up, but they're not seeing it. They thought that for a while, and it, it, just, hasn't, it just hasn't happened. Um, there are questions on the symmetric inflation target, um, and um, if, if it's truly a symmetric target and we've been below 2% for a long time, does that mean you're going to let inflation go above 2% for a long time? And how high are you going to let it go? No direct answer on that, right? He just reiterated, it's a symmetric target. It's not a ceiling, right? We're not saying 2% is as high as we'll let it go, and then it has to come down. Uh, it can go above, but he's not saying how far above. He's not saying how long it could stay above. This notion of, of the natural rate of interest came up. This is another unobservable, very important, but unobservable thing. And I think for, for Darden students, the way we think, can think about this is, it is that real interest rate, little r, where ISLM and YFE all intersect, right? And when we're at the intersection of all those things, then there's no tendency for inflation or deflation, right? The economy's kind of in a, in a, in a nice spot. Um, but again, he, he was, um, um, he kind of pushed, pushed that one away. There was then a lot of questions on fiscal policy, right? And so the Fed has no control over fiscal policy, right? That's done by uh, Treasury and Congress um, um, and, the, and the White House. Um, the, um, the first question was noting that there's a disconnect, that the Fed projections are for 2% growth in 2020 when the, when the administration's projections are for 3% growth, and that's a pretty big difference. Um, and he then said, well, if you're looking at the summary of economic projections, that's just a bunch of FOMC members writing down their opinions, right? That's not our, our official view necessarily, and so don't read too much into that. Um, but that said, if you're going to get 3% growth going forward, there has to be <coughs> substantial improvements in productivity, in labor, labor force participation, things like that. So substantial supply side um, reactions to the fiscal policy. Um, that, that came back in another question, question, so it came, was in question three, question 10, question 14 said, you know, I really want an answer to this and was very pointed um, and wanted Powell to opine on exactly how much growth we can expect from the fiscal package. Um, and again, he was, uh, he was pretty evasive on that and he, he just said, look, we're pretty sure that this fiscal package will increase demand and, and we hope it will increase supply too, right? But that was a pretty, um, uh, and then mentioned there's disparate views on this among the, among the committee members. So he, he didn't, uh, he, he wanted no part in tackling this. Um, uh, he might going forward. Um, some Fed, Fed chairs are comfortable talking about fiscal policy, Greenspan, would always tell uh, Congress what they should do. Um, Powell right now is signaling that that's Congress and the administration's um, policy to deal with, and uh, uh, we're not going to uh, opine on it right now. A um, lot of questions about the dot plots, right? The dot plots that I showed, and people want to get at what's driving movements in these dot plots. Uh, and Powell repeatedly came back to um, the fact that the dot, the, these projections are just individuals' views, right? They're not official. Uh, and he said, it, the quote is, the projections are really just individual projections that are submitted and then compiled, right? So he's just saying, take it for what it's worth, uh, read into it if you want, but I'm not going to um, actually address any questions on, on the projections. It's just a collection of views. Um, others pushed back on this. Um, and, and actually, the question 10, somebody was trying to say, well, okay, I, I think I can interpret the dot plot movements like this. And he just said, I really wouldn't put a lot into that. It could make sense. You could imagine narratives and when that would make sense. But honestly, I wouldn't put too much into that. So he's just telling us, don't read too much into the summary of, of projections. Um, somebody else pushed on what the staff forecast was, and he said, 
and the staff, meaning the 250 or 275 PhD economists in Washington that come up with the board's forecast, and he said, we don't reveal that. Um, it, I think it comes out with a, with a lag. I can't remember what the, what the exact lag is, but it, at this time, they don't, they don't reveal what the staff forecast is. Uh, I suspect that the board members' dots on the dot plots are consistent with the staff's forecast, but we don't know which dots those are. A uh, lot of questions on tariffs and trade wars as well, uh, and he pretty much just said, um, you know, that has nothing to do with us, and uh, we don't do trade policy. And when he said, we don't do trade policy, it's not that they don't think about trade policy. It's not that they don't have experts on trade policy. It's just not their, it's not, um, uh, their role, right? Their role is monetary policy. They don't decide on trade policy. So for now, for this FOMC, he said, we're not really thinking about it. It's not that, n not that important um, right this second. I suspect uh, in the next FOMC or the one after that, this will, this will um, gain uh, much more attention. Um, the next to last question was on asset bubbles and financial imbalances. And here's where, the, where Powell, I, I think, showed, um, um, was, was in his comfort zone, right? So he's not an academic economist. He's not as comfortable talking about nebulous ideas like the natural rate of interest or the natural rate of unemployment. But when you get to um, asset bubbles or financial imbalances or how banks are doing or how, how how the stress tests of banks are going, then uh, he's very comfortable with that. And so this was probably his, his longest response. Um, and it clearly showed his, his expertise, right? I mean, that's the, that's the aspect of, Fed, of, of the Fed's work that he's most comfortable with. Um, and he said that right now uh, he would, uh, the committee would say that the financial stability uh, vulnerabilities are moderate, right? So they're not, they're not that worried about it. And he went through a lot about how the banks are doing really well, they're well capitalized, household balance sheets are, uh, are, get, are strengthening over time. And yes, there are some asset prices are elevated um, and they're watching that, but, but importantly, housing prices don't seem to be <coughs> elevated. So he's, um, he's pretty, pretty satisfied with this. The final question was on the inverted yield curve. And the actual question was, would the Fed be willing to tolerate an inverted yield curve? Um, you, you, the short answer to that would be, of course, they're willing to tolerate it. Um, but Powell, Powell correctly said, interesting question. I know there's a lot of evidence out there that inverted yield curves predict recessions. Um, but actually, it's the case, I think, if you look carefully at the data that those inversions occurred when the Fed got behind the curve on inflation and had to tighten very, very quickly, right? And so it was really more um, um, quick Fed tightening, putting the, the economy into recession um, rather, than, rather than the aversion of the yield curve um, 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 by itself. So just to summarize and, and, and wrap this up, um, the first Powell FOMC uh, conference um, he's portraying uh, what I would call or others would call a Goldilocks economy, right? Seems to be just right. Moderate growth, inflation um, is, is fine, right? It's one and a half, two percent. Um, they expect a slow but steady increase in the Fed funds rate. Um, they are puzzled by the um, current relationship between slack and inflation, and so they're, they're, um, they're thinking hard about that and, and, and looking for evidence um, uh, about that relationship. They're currently reducing their balance sheet by $30 billion a month um, and expect to step that up to $50 billion. Um, importantly, he said they have no plans to use the balance sheet or the reduction in the balance sheet as a policy tool. Right? So you can imagine a situation where they might want that somebody might suggest that they s draw down their balance sheet more quickly or they stop uh, drawing down their balance sheet. He wants it to be on autopilot and not to be a policy tool. He wants the policy tool to be the Fed funds rate and let's just in an orderly way start to draw down this, this balance sheet. No clear statement on tariffs or on fiscal policy uh, other than fiscal policy will likely increase demand but we're not sure about supply and of course that's the that's the most important thing, right? So if it just increases demand at this stage in the, in the recovery, 
uh, it'll likely be inflationary. If we get a supply response, um, then inflation is less likely. Uh, and he reminded us repeatedly that the, that the dot plots uh, and the FOMC members' projections are, uh, quote, uh, really just individual projections that are submitted and then compiled. Um, so don't, don't read too much into, into those. Okay, so that's uh, um, a quick summary of Powell's first um, press conference. Thanks. Thank